Um, hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm a project officer for Citizen, um, and um, that stands for Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network, as I'm sure all, archaeolo all archaeologists are very into uh, acronyms. Um, so um, we're uh, funded by the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund um, with support from National Trust and Crown Estate and Historic England. So I'd be remiss in my duties if I didn't mention them at least a couple times. <laughs> Right, so um, what is Citizen? Uh, I'm going to s quickly skip through these, but um, so we're a community archaeology project. Um, so we're a community archaeology network, and we're supporting volunteers uh, working all along the coast um, in estuaries of England. So it's a bit of a, a big area. We've got 6,500 miles of coastline and estuary thereabouts. Um, there are obviously other projects um, already doing this, as I'm sure all of us in this room are aware. Uh, so we've had, especially um, uh, in the UK, we have um, Arthur Deer in Wales and Sharp in Scotland. Um, so following this sort of similar model, um, and again, you'll hear from them later today. Um, um, and we already have a really active local groups as well along um, English coastline uh, doing very similar work. So we're sort of drawing, drawing these people together, um, giving a sort of solid methodology um, and pumping out sort of standardized data, which is very exciting. Um, so we're trying to uh, plug that gap along the English coastline here. Uh, so we're a response to threats of climate change to our coastal heritage. Um, and we're trying to involve as, um, anyone who wants to get involved in archaeology. So we're sort of actively talking to archaeology groups. Um, but we're, again, same, same as before, we're fabulous coast users slide. Um, dog walkers, kayakers, we've been in touch with sort of rowing groups. Um, uh, we've been in touch with sort of uh, RSPB, um, sort of rangers, things like that. People who are on the coastline all the time but may not know what they're looking at. So, um, but yes, like our partner says, I've got a slide here. Boop. Archaeology for all. So we want to encourage anyone um, uh, with any sort of uh, access issues or anything, uh, any all abilities, all age groups, uh, we want everyone to get involved with this. Right, uh, here's our little baseline for coastal archaeology in England. Um, Courtney might, might recognize this slide. <laughs> I, think you, I think you made this one. <laughs> um, so we had a, a rapid coastal zone assessment surveys carried out um, across uh, British coastlines. Um, so that gives us a nice sort of baseline set. Um, uh, uh, sort of desk based assessment is the phase one. Phase two was sort of field walking and ground truthing of that um, desk based work. Um, and so that's been sort of carrying on from the sort of late 90s, and it's actually still going on. So <laughs> it's taking a while. Um, so we'll see what we can do in three years. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's still working. There's a few spots in the sort of south coast and southwest that still need uh, those done. Um, so hopefully we can help out with that. Um, let's see here. I'm losing myself. Do, 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 do. Uh, so why citizen? So there's the phase one and phase two is the desk base and the ground truthing. Um, but the, the implied phase three was long-term monitoring. Um, but no one knew uh, where the money would come from or who would do it. <laughs> so, um, so we're hoping to get some volunteers to do it. Pretty exciting. And support them. Uh, we already mentioned this before in a few other uh, talks. Um, winter storms of 2014 having a huge impact on um, rapidly uh, exposing archaeology and taking it away as well. Um, so we've got a nice little visual here of uh, all the flooding impacts on uh, especially the east coast which is slightly lower uh, down than the west coast here. Um, and I think we had sort of uh, just around here in sort of um, Haysborough and things, the, um, I think it was in the news, I, it definitely made it into international press, but the footprints coming out of Nor Norwich and Seahenge, things like that. So those were coming out rapidly, people had to go in quickly, and so this is sort of the response of why this project was um, started up by our lovely Courtney. <laughs> Let's see. So again, a common theme uh, in these talks here, uh, erosion is, is seen all across the uh, English coastline, especially even in the sort of more stable areas in the southwest, um, which are more hard rock uh, coastlines, uh, any sort of mining and quarrying will destabilize uh, the beach in front and pull things down as well. 
So um, these are more of our soft coastlines in the southeast here. Um, but yes, yeah, so this used to be on the top of the cliff, and the cliff is now meters and meters behind. Um, and uh, you can see here in uh, just nine years what the difference is. That's in Kent, I believe, isn't it? So we've got lots to, uh, to deal with. And why now? Well, public interest, this was done recently. This is a survey done in March 2015 by M. Stark England. And uh, so 66% of people responded uh, that, yes, they, do, they are interested um, uh, in archaeological sites, and they feel that they're significant and worth saving, um, and maritime heritage as well, 48%. Um, so we do have an interest here. Uh, we're hopefully not just uh, talking to other archaeologists. This is um, all people, although this might be a sampling bias because it is by historic England. <laughs> uh, and so here we come. Uh, our, our aims uh, for our project is uh, to train up at least 300, 300 citizens across uh, the country with an additional 600 um, other engaged people <laughs> and um, to look at 22 uh, at-risk sites, so sort of using them as a basis for training rather than um, extensive field work. Um, we're we're going to be looking across the whole, the whole coastline, but at least does it give us a focus for people to train on, feel comfortable, increase their confidence, and then they can go out and sort of start running their own things as well. Um, and we're based in three different offices to give us nice, nice, lots of coverage. So we're at uh, Council for British Archaeology up in York, um, at MOLA, in London and with the Nautilga Archaeology Society uh, down in Portsmouth. So that gives us a nice coverage uh, for community-based archaeology programs. We've got a lot of experience in that, a lot of experience in um, training as well. So let's see. Oh, huh, that's so. Uh, three years of funding. Thank you so much. National, <laughs> National Lottery Fund, uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, um, and uh, National Trust Crown Estate, Sir King. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we've got three years. Um, to really establish a strong network. Um, we've only done the first year now, so we're just coming out of the summer season. Um, so that's kind of what I'll be talking about, just a little snapshot of what we've sort of experienced in our first year of setting up and sort of any snags and things. So why do we record England uh, intertidal heritage? Uh, it's not protected um, by statutory sort of planning conditions and things like that. Most people aren't gonna be building in the intertidal zone, uh, so you don't really have much uh, planning condition uh, recording by uh, record or preservation by record. So um, we're hoping to kind of fill that uh, gap and to monitor erosion um, and to increase the sort of data produced about these sites. So I kind of mentioned this before. So we've talked about the rapid coastal zone assessments. We have a nice baseline sort of snapshot so we can build on top of that, add new data, um, modify things. Uh, see what's still visible from the original data that we have, uh, add to new things that have since shown up since the rapid coastal zone assessments were done potentially 20 years ago. Um, and uh, things like the um, Historic England Peat database. Um, MOLA did a database about uh, all the vessels and hulks along, along the English coastline and data from local archaeology groups as well um, because we do have a lot of active ones, uh, sort of Colchester and um, Chichester and the Thames as well. Uh, and we're basically anything you can find on the coast is what we'll be recording. Um, so prehistoric um, peat, submerged settle, uh, settlements and forests, um, vessels, maritime heritage, coastal industry, uh, all the way through to modern uh, period. We get some excellent World War II stuff down, down Bridlington at the bottom. Unfortunately, we're not about the finds. We're focusing on features. Um, and like we said before, um, uh, in the previous, previous mm -hmm. talk, um, actually the very first talk, you don't want to uh, duplicate the effort, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel. So um, we'll be focusing on the features along the coast of England, but what happens to the finds? So we are working really um, closely with the Portable Antiquity Scheme in England. Um, they have a, their own HLF-funded volunteer program uh, called Past Explorers. So if any of our volunteers are um, really keen on finds or um, are very interested in finds collection and management, then we've been hoping to encourage cross-training uh, with the Past Explorers team, and vice versa, if any of them are really interested in coastal heritage. Okay, so our methodology quickly. Um, so we're training uh, already existing groups um, to provide a nice, stable base 
um, and then incorporating new volunteers into those groups as well uh, to monitor sort of their little patch, kind of take ownership of that. Um, we've got a standardized format of recording um, with pro formas and an app, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and that's all quality controlled by um, the eight members of staff on our team um, before it's uh, released as sort of open access data on our website and deposited uh, with the archaeology data service as well. And this is compatible um, with work carried out in the UK as well, so it's very, very similar to Sharps. All right, so I'll quickly go through our training program. Um, we've developed a sort of skills passport uh, with a Badger, which is the British Archaeological Jobs Resource. Uh, so they've developed this uh, skills passport just generally for archaeology. And so we're working with them to add um, new pages for uh, intertidal zone archaeology as well, because it was sort of neglected. It's more focused on terrestrial archaeology, field archaeology. And so we've um, worked with them to create another one, another version, with um, maritime and intertidal archaeology represented as well. Um, so we're sort of focusing on a like tiered uh, like approach to training. So level one is introduction to archaeology in general. Ooh, sorry, hello. <laughs> Excited. Uh, archaeology in general and intertidal zone archaeology, because it can be quite different if you're very focused on terrestrial archaeology. And yet health and safety and things like that, very important. And that's mostly off-site. So it'd be lectures, it'd be um, learning how to plan off of a baseline in someone's backyard, that kind of thing, um, to get comfortable about uh, being in an intertidal zone before you get there, because you don't want to get your feet wet <laughs> trying to figure out how to work a baseline. Uh, level two is specialist skills development, so how to record vessels, what you're looking for, how to recognize certain features. Um, and then that would usually involve on-site training as well. Um, but then again, because we want to be accessible to everyone, if on-site training isn't possible, we also do encourage uh, d uh, more in-depth research uh, training on how to use archives, uh, how to use um, Heritage Gateway, things like that. So um, people can still get involved without having to uh, be on site, you know, not be in the lashing rain, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and data collection uh, through pro formas and um, digitally. And level three, again, is uh, encouraging more research and dissemination. So if anyone wanted to publish things or even write a little blog post for our website, uh, we would encourage that as well. Um, and all of our training um, courses are compatible, compatible with an NVQ level three, which is through the CIFA um, in England. So anything that they, they get taught gets recorded onto these little passports, and you can use that as evidence to show that you can get a um, vocational qualification. So this is pretty exciting. Um, this seems to be the way of the game here, um, mobile apps and interactive maps. This is very much heavily borrowed from the Sharp uh, project. Um, in fact, we use the same web developers. So, um, so it's very, very compatible data. Um, and it's all created. I've got a little site form here. So on your phone, you can go around. Everything's got GPS and uh, camera attached to it. So it's a perfect tool. Um, so you can snap a few photos, uh, get your GPS location by clicking the button. Um, and it's within a few meters of accuracy, but um, it's better than it not being recorded at all, and that's kind of um, the idea for this. Enter a quick description, um, and that gets fact-checked by us, so we can go double-check that as well. And, excuse me, uh, if you did on paper as well, so if you didn't have a smartphone, say, um, you could go out, figure out your location, and then use a Google Maps to zoom in, um, and then click a point on the map and add it that way as well. Um, and that's all accessible for free. So um, even if you're not a registered user, you could um, you could look at sites like this here and get the basic information. But then you'd have to register further to edit or add your own sites. Right? Where does the data go? <laughs> we have to. We don't just want to create data for data's sake and then um, you know stick it under the bed and never show anybody else. Um, so we we have a plan of creating this data, depositing it with a central repository, um, the Archaeology Data Service, and then this filters back out through to the um, Heritage Environment, uh, Historic Environment Record. Ooh. So they keep their data up to date as well. Um, 
it sort of tops up the rapid coastal zone assessment from uh, earlier. Um, and then it's being used for um, research purposes as well. All right, so what are we doing? Probably not talking very long, that's all right. <laughs> so our national training and outreach. So it's about, all about raising awareness, um, getting people to feel confident about being in this um, intertidal zone, especially places like this, where the Seven Sisters, if you can see the white cliffs back there. Uh, so it's a big heck of a walk. <laughs> so you do have to feel very confident um, about going to places like this. But it is quite rewarding when you see something like this. This is a, a shipwreck of a clipper, um, the Kunato, which uh, sailed from Australia and didn't quite make it. <laughs> so we're recording that now with some volunteers uh, from a national trust um, and a few national trust rangers. And I believe there is um, a, a lifeboats uh, volunteer as well. So we actually do a themed approach, which also an um, intertidal zone, you get a lot of uh, different things happening at the same time. So you can have a prehistoric right next to something that's quite modern, um, but to provide a focus for people because some people are very interested in one f aspect than another. Um, give, give it a bit, uh, a bit more understanding here. So we're focusing on ships in May. Um, so anybody who's uh, interested in vessels or shipyard building, um, this is a pretty great one. That's in Perton. Uh, June, we focus on uh, coastal defenses and military defenses. Um, these are some searchlight emplacements at the White Cliffs of Dover. It's pretty great. Um, and anything sort of, uh, it can go from modern all the way through to Roman forts, um, Saxon forts, things like that. Um, again, providing focus on military defenses. July is a bit more of a free-for-all. It's um, the Festival for British Archaeology in July with our partners, uh, the CBA. Um, so again, it's tying into that. It's getting a lot of publicity. It's in, in focusing more on coastal um, erosion and making that a part of archaeology as well. Um, because most people think of uh, sort of Festival of Archaeology as digging a test pit in somebody's yard. But um, this is getting people out. Um, this is the foreshore at Greenwich here. Um, and uh, exposing them to sort of a new type of archaeology they might have not might have thought of. Um, August is coastal industry. Uh, this is a brick kiln um, down at Brownsey Island, on the south coast, um, and kind of emphasizing that even if industry has changed um, in the past or in or currently, you know, sort of fishing it doesn't look the same as it used to. You know, focusing on uh, what fish traps are, how they would have been used. Um, mining, quarrying, um, uh, brick, brick making. <laughs> uh, September will be uh, lost landscapes, so submerged forests, um, peat shelves, um, sort of occupation layers that were terrestrial but are not anymore. Um, and again, exploring that, exploring climate change over a sort of longer term, um, especially since England is an island, but at this time it would have been connected to uh, to Europe, maybe. I, I broke it. <laughs> oh no. Sorry, everyone. I literally no idea what happened. Let's whiz through. La, 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 la. In review. <laughs> okay, that's it. It was the last slide. So, what have we been up to? We've only been going since, um, well, active field work since May. Um, but already we've had 250 people attend our training sessions. So, we do definitely have an interest. Um, in this coastal archaeology, I do feel it's very sustainable if these are the kind of numbers we're getting in the first year um, with, you know, teething problems and all, everything. Um, we've had at least 800 people attend outreach events um, across the country. Um, and with our website only having been launched in August, we've had 220 people sign up um, as interested in recording sites. So incredible, incredible pickup. Um, long may it continue. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we'll see how it goes. I think the training, we've had really positive responses um, on our evaluation forms. Um, people have always said that they're really interested in, in hearing more about it. They want the feedback, like mentioned before, because otherwise it doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, what's a timber on the, on the floor? Uh, if you don't explain, oh, no, this is elm, and this, this means that it's 4,000 years old, and this one was 6,000 years old, so it was a forest for 2,000 years. Um, and people are fascinated by that because because they're actually doing something that's worthwhile and they're learning about it. So um, it's very exciting. But 
Um, and that's everything, I guess. Right. Hello. <laughs>